Magnificent Delusions, Pakistan, the United States, and an Epic History of Misunderstanding by Hussain Haqqani A doubtful friend is worse than a certain enemy. Let a man be one thing or the other, and we then know how to meet him. Aesop, Aesop's Fables Introduction Over the last two decades, U.S.-Pakistan relations have often been described as America's most difficult external relationship. Although the two countries have been nominal allies dating back to Pakistan's independence in 1947, their relationship has never been free of friction. Even in its heyday during the 1950s and 1960s, the U.S.-Pakistan partnership was far from an alliance based on shared values and interests. Instead, each of the two partners was always preoccupied with confronting different enemies and pinning different expectations to their association. Pakistan's motive in pursuing an alliance with the United States is driven by its quest for security against its much larger neighbour, India. Pakistan has repeatedly turned to the United States as its most significant source of expensive weapons and economic aid. Although, in the hope of winning U.S. support for Pakistan's regional aims, Pakistani leaders have assured U.S. officials that they share the United States' global security concerns, Pakistan has been repeatedly disappointed because the United States does not share Pakistan's fears of Indian hegemony in South Asia. For its part, the United States has also chased a mirage when it has assumed that, over time, its assistance to Pakistan would engender a sense of security among Pakistanis, thereby leading to a change in Pakistan's priorities and objectives. The United States initially poured money and arms into Pakistan in the hope of building a major fighting force that could assist in defending Asia against communism. Pakistan repeatedly failed to live up to its promises to provide troops for any of the wars the United States fought against communist forces, instead using American weapons in its wars with India. Furthermore, US hopes of persuading Pakistan to give up or curtail its nuclear weapons program, or to stop using jihadi militants as proxies in regional conflicts, have similarly proved futile. Three American presidents, Dwight D. Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon B. Johnson, have asked the question, what do we get from aiding Pakistan? 5. Jimmy Carter, George H. W. Bush, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush and Barack Obama have wondered aloud whether Pakistan's leaders can be trusted to keep their word. Meanwhile in Pakistan, successive governments have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to maintain Pakistan's freedom of action while depending on US aid. But neither country has changed its core policies, nor have they given up the hope that the other will change. The US-Pakistan relationship has depended largely on cordial ties between leaders and officials who have often misunderstood each other's intentions and limitations. Whereas Pakistanis have often benefited from the American tendency to ignore history and focus only on immediate goals, Americans have often assumed that building up Pakistan's economic and military capacity provides them leverage, even after periodically finding out the limits of US influence. And both sides have their own stereotypes about each other, traceable back to Pakistan's emergence as an independent country. During that period, soon after emerging from British India's bloody partition in 1947, Pakistan's leaders confronted an uncertain future for their new country. When most of the world was indifferent to Pakistan as the potential homeland of South Asia's Muslims, India antagonized Pakistan without compromise or compassion. Because of this, soon after independence, Pakistan's founding fathers, encouraged by some British geostrategists, decided that they would continue to maintain the large army they had inherited, even though the new nation could not afford to pay for it from its own resources and did not immediately face a visible security threat. 
Given Pakistan's location at the crossroads of the Middle East and South Asia and its relative proximity to the Soviet Union, Pakistanis assumed that the United States would take an interest in financing and arming the fledgling new state. Thus, the gap in expectations between American and Pakistani leaders that has bedeviled their relationship over the last 65 years should have been apparent right at the beginning, when Pakistan's founding father and its first governor-general, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, asked the United States for a $2 billion aid package in September 1947. But the United States gave Pakistan only $10 million in assistance that first year. International relations thinkers like Hans J. Morgenthau and George Kennan did not see Pakistan's value to the United States as an ally. After all, Pakistan's primary concern, competing with India for regional influence, was not a strategic concern for the United States. But after Dwight D. Eisenhower was elected president in 1952, his Secretary of State John Foster Dulles embraced the idea that Pakistan could be influenced into sharing U.S. strategic concerns in exchange for weapons and aid. Primarily because of geopolitical considerations, the United States has enlisted Pakistan as an ally on three occasions. During the Cold War, 1954 to 1972, the war against the Soviets in Afghanistan, 1979 to 1989, and the war against terrorism, 2001 to present. In each instance, the US motive for seeking Pakistani alliance has been different from Pakistan's reasons for accepting it. For example, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the United States saw an opportunity to avenge the Vietnam War and bleed the Soviet Red Army with the help of Mujahideen, militant Islamic radicals trained by Pakistan's Inter-Services Intelligence, ISI, and funded by United States Central Intelligence Agency, CIA. Pakistan, however, looked upon the military action in Afghanistan as a jihad to be used as the launching pad for asymmetric warfare that would increase its clout against India. Since my days as a student at Karachi University, I found the anti-American narrative that was prevalent all around me difficult to believe. I spent many hours at the American Center Library, reading books and articles that exposed me to different perspectives of historic events. Unlike my colleagues, I could see through the absurdity of conspiracy theories. When student protesters burned down the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad in 1979, I was a student leader allied to Islamists on my campus. A huge demonstration was organized at short notice, with university buses commandeered to transport protesters to the U.S. consulate in Karachi. Several student speakers urged the mob to burn down the consulate, and the mob was ready to do so until I was called on to speak. My speech, citing the Quran and demanding that ascertainment of facts precede action, saved the U.S. consulate and its library from meeting the same fate as the embassy in Islamabad. Later, as a journalist, I covered the anti-Soviet Afghan war, observing firsthand the flow of U.S. arms to the Mujahideen. My first foray into government was as advisor to Nawaz Sharif, who in 1989 aspired to become Prime Minister of Pakistan. I accompanied Sharif on his introductory visit to the United States as opposition leader. Once Sharif became Prime Minister, I acted as his liaison with US media and diplomats before we parted ways quietly after differences of opinion. In 1992, Pakistan's support for jihadi groups nearly caused it to be designated a state sponsor of terrorism. I worked with Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, who in 1993 succeeded Sharif's first government and worked to fend off that label. My close association with Bhutto resulted in my own incarceration toward the end of the second Sharif government, 1997 to 1999, and my opposition to General Pervez Musharraf's military dictatorship forced me to exile to the United States a few months after 9-11. Over all these years, I have seen Americans make mistakes in their dealings with Pakistan as well as in their overall foreign policy. 
Nonetheless, I have always been convinced that the United States remains a force for good in the world. Pakistan has benefited from its relations with the United States, and would benefit even more if it could overcome erroneous assumptions about its own national security and role in the world. Instead of seeking close security ties based on false promises, Pakistan must face its history and diversity honestly, and it should be neither dependent on nor resentful of the world's most powerful nation. As Pakistan's ambassador to the United States from 2008 to 2011, I sought to overcome the bitterness of the past in order to help lay the foundations for a long-term partnership. I studied the relations between the United States and its other partners, so as to figure out why almost all post World War II U.S. allies have found prosperity and stability through this partnership, whereas Pakistan has not. But major power centers in my own country resisted my vision of a broader U.S.-Pakistan partnership rooted in mutual trust. Instead of appreciating my efforts to redefine the U.S.-Pakistan relationship through an honest appraisal of past mistakes, Pakistan security services saw me as working for American rather than Pakistani interests. Through the media, I was falsely accused of helping the CIA expand its network of spies in Pakistan, and my remarks about the transactional nature of past ties were distorted so as to suggest that I described Pakistanis. As beggars. In the end, I was forced to resign amid fabricated charges that I had sought help from the U.S. military through a dubious American businessman of Pakistani origin in order to avert a coup. But the willingness of my countrymen to believe the worst about their ambassador reflects a deeper pathology. Instead of basing international relations on facts. Pakistanis have become accustomed to seeing the world through the prism of an Islamo-nationalist ideology. Even well-travelled, erudite, and articulate Pakistani officials echo this ideology without realizing that holding tight to these self-defeating ideas makes little impact on the rest of the world. The gap is widening between how Pakistanis and the rest of the world view Pakistan. Somehow. Half-hearted and time-limited transactions, rather than an honest dialogue over shared interests, seem to be the default pattern in U.S.-Pakistan relations. For instance, as stated above, I found the two countries working toward very different outcomes in Afghanistan. I fear that the prospect of their alliance may end in acrimony once again. The re-emergence of democracy in Pakistan. Offers the hope that Pakistanis will someday be able to debate their national interests realistically, and alter their national priorities so as to align more with those of the United States. If, however, the propaganda and the political strategies of the powerful Pakistani military continue to hold sway, alienation from the United States will remain inevitable. Additionally. Pakistanis are not likely to alter their priorities solely as part of a bargain involving aid and arms from the United States. Moreover, both countries are wrong when they assume that even as they act at cross purposes, they will eventually succeed in persuading the other of their own respective points of view. Since its independence in 1947, Pakistan has debated its raison d'être. A vocal and powerful minority insists that the country was created to be an Islamic state, a semi-theocracy governed by religious principles, divined by those who support that vision. And in response to Pakistan's insecurity toward India, and the fear of this much larger neighbor culturally, if not politically, reabsorbing Pakistan, many otherwise modern, educated generals, judges, and politicians have embraced this Islamist paradigm. Because of this, Pakistan's short history as a nation has witnessed the demonization of many secularists as foreign collaborators and enemies of the national ideology. Furthermore, the country has failed to sustain economic growth, which has increased during times of cooperation with the United States, only to come to a halt during periods of estrangement. Pakistanis have seldom pondered why, after six decades of alliance with the United States, 
the country has not been able to build the kind of economy that other U.S. allies such as South Korea and Taiwan have managed to create for themselves. American critics of Pakistan point out that Pakistan has always pursued its own agenda, which seldom coincides with American interests. Yet it repeatedly seeks U.S. aid and arms without keeping the commitments it makes to acquire that assistance. As a result, the list of American grievances is long. Pakistan developed nuclear weapons while promising the United States that it would not. The United States helped arm and train mujahideen against the Soviets during the 1980s, but Pakistan chose to keep these militants well armed and sufficiently funded. Even after the Soviet withdrawal in 1989, and from the American perspective, Pakistan's crackdown on terrorist groups, particularly after 9/11, has been half-hearted at best. The relationship between the United States and Pakistan is a tale of exaggerated expectations, broken promises, and disastrous misunderstandings. The discovery of Osama bin Laden in Pakistan in May 2011. Further and significantly undermined any hope of convincing Americans that Pakistan was an ally, albeit one with its own concerns and difficulties. Many have noted that radical Islam, Pakistan's military, and U.S.-Pakistan relations have shaped Pakistan's history, and I have spent most of my life at the intersection of these three critical elements. As a Pakistani. I feel that my country cannot forever depend on external factors for its survival and progress, and that my compatriots need to set aside their contrived narrative and face the harsh facts of recent history. Conversely, Americans must realize that their policies toward Pakistan have helped neither the United States nor Pakistan's people. In his 1842 book *American Notes*, Charles Dickens described Washington, D.C. A purpose-built capital, as a city of magnificent intentions. In this way, Islamabad is similar to Washington D.C., as it is a new city with no history before the 1960s, when wheat fields and bushes were cleared in order to establish it as Pakistan's capital. And though these two cities' histories may parallel each other, Washington's magnificent intentions and delusions have often clashed with those of Islamabad. This book is an account of that clash. Although I have been witness to some critical events in U.S.-Pakistan relations, this is not intended to be a personal memoir. Chapter One: False Start. One month after Pakistan's creation as an independent state in August 1947, the country's founder and first Governor General Muhammad Ali Jinnah. Sat down at his stately residence in Karachi, the Flagstaff House, for an interview with Life magazine reporter and photographer Margaret Bork White. His followers revered the charismatic Jinnah as the Kaidi Azam, the great leader, but his detractors blamed him for the violent partition of British India that had carved out the subcontinent's northwestern and northeastern provinces into a new Muslim-majority British dominion. Most American journalists covering the events leading to Indian and Pakistani independence were less than sympathetic to the idea of Pakistan, and Bork White was no exception. But Pakistanis deemed her magazine particularly prejudiced against their newly born country, because Life's sister publication, Time, had derided Jinnah as the Pooh Bar of Pakistan, dismissed the country as the creation of one clever man, Jinnah. And described Pakistan's birth as a slick political trick, when compared to the mass movement Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi led for India's independence. After asking probing questions about Jinnah's plans for the new nation's constitution, Bork White sought his views of relations with the United States. Jinnah replied that America needs Pakistan more than Pakistan needs America. He then told her. Pakistan is the pivot of the world, as we are placed, and went on to state the frontier on which the future position of the world revolves. Russia is not so very far away. He spoke of America's interest in arming Greece and Turkey, and expressed the hope that the United States would pour money and arms into Pakistan as well. 
In response to these answers, Bork White wrote disapprovingly, In Jinnah's mind, this brave new nation had no other claim on America's friendship than this, that across a wild tumble of roadless mountain ranges lay the land of the Bolsheviks. I wondered whether the Kaidi Azam considered his new state only as an armoured buffer between opposing major powers. This account of Pakistani thinking within weeks of its creation offers perspectives into the vagaries of US-Pakistan relations over the last six and a half decades. Amid frequent Pakistani charges of American betrayal, few Americans remember that Pakistan initiated the US-Pakistan alliance primarily to compensate for its economic and military disadvantages. At the time when Jinnah described Pakistan as a country that was the pivot of the world, the United States had given little thought to the new nation and its possible role in international security. Although the US Embassy was the first diplomatic mission to open for business in Karachi, fewer people staffed the building than the number posted in the US Embassy in Cuba at that same time. Oblivious to American disinterest, however, Pakistanis had high expectations of one of the world's two superpowers. Bork White wrote that government officials would say to her, Surely America will build our army, and surely America will give us loans to keep Russia from walking in. But neither she nor the Pakistani officials she spoke to saw signs of Soviet infiltration. They would reply almost sadly, she said, as though sorry not to be able to make more of the argument. No, Russia has shown no signs of being interested in Pakistan. Several months before Jinnah sat down for his interview with Bork White, he had addressed American diplomats about his expectation that the United States should help Pakistan build its economy and military, in return for Pakistan mobilizing Muslim nations against the Soviet Union. At that time, May of 1947, the country was still an idea, and discussions about partitioning India had not yet concluded when Jinnah sat down for a one-and-a-half-hour meeting with Raymond Hare of the State Department's Division of Middle Eastern and Indian Affairs, as well as Thomas Weil, Second Secretary at the Embassy in New Delhi. According to the two diplomats' account of the meeting, Jinnah told them that the establishment of Pakistan was essential to prevent Hindu imperialism spreading into the Middle East. In his vision, the Muslim countries would stand together against possible Russian aggression and would look to the United States for assistance. But Americans wondered how Pakistan could be an American ally without a shared interest. They pointed to frequent jibes against U.S. economic imperialism and dollar diplomacy in Dawn, the newspaper Jinnah founded to advance the cause of Pakistan. Jinnah responded with an explanation that foretold Pakistan's future interaction with the United States, stating that the Dawn editors simply reflected the attitude of Indian Muslims in general toward America. And, he added jokingly, they had to make a living. He said that he realized that the US government was probably open-minded about Pakistan. Nonetheless, most Indian Muslims felt Americans were against them. Jinnah cited two reasons for this view. First, he said, because most Americans seemed opposed to Pakistan. And second, because the US government and people backed Jews against Arabs in Palestine. Jinnah's expectation of US aid for Pakistan, American officials' concerns about anti-Americanism, and Bork White's cynicism about Pakistani objectives around the time of the country's inception, together seem like the prologue to a story with many repetitions. The life correspondent discerned in Pakistan a persistently voiced hope of tapping the US Treasury, which led her to wonder whether the purpose was to bolster the world against Bolshevism or to bolster Pakistan's own uncertain position as a new political entity. Ultimately, in Bork White's opinion, it was more nearly related to the even more significant bankruptcy of ideas in the new Muslim state, a nation drawing its spurious warmth from the embers of an antique religious fanaticism fanned into a new blaze. The first anti-American demonstration in Pakistan was reported from Karachi in May 1948. 
In the years that followed, during the 1950s and 1960s, mobs continued to attack U.S. official buildings in Pakistan. In 1979, a hostile crowd burned down the U.S. embassy in Islamabad, the only U.S. embassy to ever be completely gutted because police did not arrive in time to protect it. The September 1982 issue of the Journal of Conflict Resolution carried an article by Pakistani civil servant Shokat Nagmi, in which he analysed key words used in the Pakistani press between 1965 and 1979, and subsequently found evidence for widespread anti-Americanism dating back to the beginning of the study. But this roller coaster ride of US Pakistan relations cannot be understood without understanding the circumstances of Pakistan's creation, the world view of its elite, and the miscalculations by both American and Pakistani leaders that have made the two countries military allies amidst mistrust and without really being friends. The emergence of Pakistan as an independent state in 1947 was the culmination of decades of debate and divisions among Muslims in British India regarding their collective future. After British rule was consolidated in the 19th century, Muslims found themselves deprived of the privileged status they had enjoyed under the Muslim Mughal Empire that had dominated South Asia since 1526. Some of the Muslim leaders embraced territorial nationalism and did not define their collective personality through religion. As opposition to British rule grew, these leaders called for the Muslim population to participate fully in the Indian nationalist movement led by the Indian National Congress of Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru. But others felt that Muslims had a special identity that ethnic and territorial nationalism centred primarily on the Hindu majority in India, would erase over time. Coalescing in the All India Muslim League and led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah, these Muslim nationalists, as opposed to Indian nationalists in the secular Indian National Congress led by Gandhi and Nehru, asserted that India's Muslims constituted a separate nation from non-Muslim Indians, and because of this, demanded the creation of a separate country in areas with a Muslim majority. British India's Muslim majority provinces lay in its northwest and northeast, leading to Pakistan comprising two wings that were separated by India until December 1971, when the eastern wing became the new state of Bangladesh. Pakistan's creation represented the general acceptance of the two-nation theory that Muslims and Hindus constituted two distinct nations in view of their unique experience in India, a theory that had been periodically articulated long before the formal demand for a Pakistan state in 1940, but had never been fully explained in terms of how it could be applied. Although the creation of Pakistan was intended to save South Asia's Muslims from being a permanent minority within India, it never became the homeland of all of South Asia's Muslims. One third of the Indian subcontinent's Muslims remained behind as a minority in Hindu-dominated India, even after the 1947 partition. The other two thirds now live in two separate countries, Pakistan and Bangladesh, confirming the doubts that some expressed before independence about the practicality of applying the two-nation theory. In return for gaining one country of their own, the Muslim nation was effectively divided into three separate states. Until the end of the Second World War, the Indian struggle for independence had received little attention in the United States. Instead, American interest had focused on the countries flanking the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. Although India had been crucial to Britain's war effort, it was less significant for American policy. Nonetheless, the United States set up a diplomatic presence in Delhi in 1941, and a special representative for President Franklin D. Roosevelt arrived in 1942. These American officials sympathised with the demand for Indian independence, leading to strong disagreement with British colonial officials. But US sympathy with the anti-colonial sentiment in the subcontinent did not translate into sympathy for Muslim separatism which most Americans dealing with India 
found impractical. According to Special Representative William Phillips, President Roosevelt thought that the idea of partitioning India sounded terrible when the British chargé d'affaires Sir Ronald Campbell first mentioned it to him. It reminded the President of the experience of the American Civil War, Phillips recalled. Although Phillips found Jinnah to be brilliant and was personally attracted to him, he could not agree with the leader's views. The more I studied Mr Jinnah's Pakistan, he concluded, the less it appealed to me as the answer to India's communal problem, since to break India into two separate nations would weaken both and might open Pakistan, at least, to the designs of ambitious neighbours. From the American perspective, the notion of a significant minority seeking separation rather than safeguards for itself opened doors for perennial conflict. Post-colonial nations all over the world would fragment as a result of similar separatist demands. The relatively sparse commentary in the US media reinforced the officials' views. Tom Trainer, reporting for the Los Angeles Times in March 1943, wrote, Every instinct will persuade you that there shouldn't be a Pakistan, which means the succession of the Mohammedan portion of India from the Hindu portion. In his view, only an old-school southerner who thinks Appomattox was a shocking bad show could go for Pakistan. Trainer described Jinnah as the greatest successionist since 1865 and suggested that Jinnah is just an old, die-hard South Carolinian at heart who believes Jeff Davis ought to have been president. For supporters of the Pakistan movement, such comments reflected America's lack of empathy and further fueled a sense of insecurity and isolation that had drawn many of them to demand Pakistan's creation in the first place. From their point of view, Jinnah was a combination of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. He had created a country, not divided a nation. To this day, Americans tend to know and admire Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, seen as an apostle of peace, far more than they recognize Jinnah. This contrasts significantly with the Pakistani characterization of Jinnah as a man of ideals and integrity, with extraordinary qualities of vision. University of California historian Stanley Wolpert would later observe that few individuals significantly alter the course of history, and fewer still modify the map of the world. Hardly anyone can be credited with creating a nation-state. Muhammad Ali Jinnah did all three. For Pakistanis, this comment would supersede the opinions of Americans who disparaged Jinnah during his life. Almost four decades after Pakistan's birth, Walpurt pointed out that Jinnah virtually conjured that country into statehood by the force of his indomitable will. Walpurt recognized Jinnah's primacy in Pakistan's history, saying that it looms like a lofty minaret over the achievements of all his contemporaries in the Muslim League. But during the 1940s, there was little American sympathy for conjuring a new Asian country based on religion. After the end of World War II, Jinnah made a major effort to explain the idea of creating a Muslim state to American officials and to win them over to his argument. Consul General in India, John C. MacDonald, sent a detailed telegram to Secretary of State George C. Marshall after meeting Jinnah on March 5, 1947, at his residence in Bombay. According to MacDonald, Jinnah said he was anxious to hear about the American reaction to the British proposal to transfer power to responsible Indian hands, not later than June 1948. Jinnah reportedly said that he could understand the American public's surprise as well as impatience with India for not finding a solution to its political problems following Britain's offer of independence. However, Jinnah felt that news regarding Indian problems in the American press is influenced by false propaganda. The Consul General noted that Jinnah blamed the highly efficient propaganda organization of the Indian Congress Party for turning Americans against Pakistan, a suggestion the US official tried to repudiate. More significantly, Jinnah, the leader of the All India Muslim League, 
shared with MacDonald his disappointment and frustration with the lack of international support for the Indian Muslims' demand for a separate homeland. He spoke of a reception for him in Cairo upon his return from London earlier in the year, where a group of prominent Egyptians told him that, their warmth for a brother Muslim notwithstanding, they found his policy annoying. The Egyptians accused Jinnah of being in league with the British instead of working for Indian independence, a charge that he vehemently rebuffed. The Indian Muslims Qaidi Azam, great leader, was offended that fellow Muslims outside the subcontinent failed to support his lofty cause. He told the accusing group that if the Indian National Congress really wanted to test his sincerity regarding his desire for Indian independence, they should agree to Pakistan. MacDonald reported. After this agreement, Jinnah would immediately accept the responsibility placed upon him for taking the necessary steps to establish a constitutional government. The cable quoted Jinnah as saying, I would be the first to go down to the gateway of India to wave farewell to the British. It went on to describe Jinnah's principal argument for dividing the subcontinent. As narrated by Consul General MacDonald, the Muslims, according to Mr. Jinnah, cannot accept the idea of united India because in doing so they would merely be substituting a Hindu Raj for the British Raj. Jinnah described suggestions of a compromise as foolish, saying there was no basis for it. In his view, the difference in culture, religion and way of life between the Muslims and Hindus precludes any possibility of a compromise. Jinnah asked why a hundred million Muslims should become a minority in a Hindu-dominated government, and argued that safeguards for a minority in a united India were worthless because in the event of an appeal by the minority, the accused would sit as the judges of the accusers. The only recourse left to the Muslims in such an eventuality would be an appeal to the United Nations. Jinnah's discussion with the U.S. Consul General revealed the difficulty he faced when attempting to persuade people outside the subcontinent, including Muslims, of Pakistan's raison d'etre. Although Jinnah and most of his colleagues were not known for religious observance, they were espousing a vague Islamo-nationalism that others saw as an ideology that could easily become the basis for more pietistic demands. And as feared, once Pakistan was finally created, the insecurities about Muslim identity in the modern era that led to its creation were absorbed into the identity of the new state, and the bombast about Hindu imperialism and threats to Islam carried on into India-Pakistan relations and how Pakistanis view international affairs. After all, Pakistan was not just to be a country. It had become a cause. But the outward secular and westernized orientation of the Pakistani elite confused Westerners. They assumed that Pakistan's leaders shared Western values and were simply trying to win the hearts of their followers by appealing to religious sentiments. As such, American and British policymakers did not see saying one thing to a domestic and another to a foreign audience as a problem. But this habit had serious consequences including religious violence in the run-up to Pakistan's independence and the large-scale expulsion of non-Muslims from the Pakistan region. Once the country had emerged, it encountered difficulty when attempting to reconcile its professed tenets with the demands of pragmatic, political and economic considerations. As a result, throughout the country's history, Pakistanis have been divided between those who want a greater role for religion in their nation's collective life and those who do not. On the one hand, Islam is described as the uniting factor for Pakistan's disparate ethnicities. On the other, it is also the basis for polarization and sectarian divisions. Pakistan's independence movement was relatively short. It began with the All India Muslim League's demand for separate Muslim states in 1940, and ended with the announcement of the partition plan in June 1947. The original demand was for multiple independent states of Muslim-majority provinces of India. 
The idea of a single Pakistani state evolved later. Although Pakistan was to be created in the areas where Muslims were a majority, referred to as Muslim-majority provinces, its strongest support and most of its national leadership came from regions where the Muslims were a minority, Muslim-minority provinces. Muslims from the minority provinces were better educated and had greater representation in the British Indian civil services and the military's officer corps than did their co-religionists in the majority provinces. Recognizing this, the original demand for Pakistan did not envisage any mass transfer of populations. After all, one-third of India's Muslims were to remain behind in India after the partition, and privileged Muslims who were not far from territories belonging to the new state were to govern Pakistan. Initially, the call for Pakistan resonated with Muslims in the minority provinces, whereas the landed Muslim gentry of the majority provinces supported provincial parties. Although the Muslim League belatedly won over local notables in the provinces that were to constitute Pakistan, it could not build consensus among its leaders over the new country's future direction. In February 1947, a few months before independence, Khwaja Nazimuddin, who later became Pakistan's second governor-general, as well as its second prime minister, candidly told a British governor that he did not know what Pakistan means and that nobody in the Muslim League knew. This echoed Nazimuddin's discussion with the governor of Bengal, Richard Casey, in September 1945. Casey recorded in his diary that he asked Nazimuddin many questions about Pakistan. Very little has been discussed or worked out by them, the Englishman lamented, referring to the Muslim League leaders. In another meeting with Nazimuddin, Casey shared his view that the Muslim League had had only the most cursory examination and thought given to the consequences of India's division. I believe that they relied too implicitly on their leader, Mr Jinnah, and that, apart from whatever thoughts he may have given to the subject, I did not believe that any other Muslim had really applied himself to the study of the many problems involved, he wrote. Sir Bertrand Glancy, the governor of Punjab, the other major province designated to be part of Pakistan, shared similar anxieties about Jinnah's scheme. Clancy revealed his concerns about the logic of the demand for Pakistan in a secret letter to the Viceroy, Field Marshal Archibald Wavell, written in August 1946, ahead of elections that would choose India's future leaders. I must confess that I am gravely perturbed about the situation because there is a very serious danger of the elections being fought, so far as Muslims are concerned, on an entirely false issue, he wrote. Crude Pakistan may be quite illogical, undefinable and ruinous to India and in particular to Muslims, Glancy went on. But this does not detract from its potency as a political slogan. The uninformed Muslim will be told that the question he is called on to answer at the polls is, are you a true believer or an infidel and a traitor? Glancy presently warned that the Muslims would be swayed by the false and fanatical scream that Islam is in danger, and that if Pakistan becomes an imminent reality, we shall be heading straight for bloodshed on a wide scale. But the lukewarm British efforts at reconciling the Congress and the Muslim League between the end of the war in 1945 and until 1947 proved ineffective. The Congress leadership failed to guarantee safeguards acceptable to a majority of the Muslim elite. Even if the demand for Pakistan was initially a negotiating stratagem to ensure protections for the Muslim minority in a post-British India, the idea of it had moved millions of Indian Muslims into expecting a separate country. While devoting their energies to pleading for it, Muslim leaders had made no preparations for running that separate state. Franchise in the 1946 election was limited by several qualifications, such as college education, service in the British government, and property ownership. Thus, only the most elite, 15% of the population, had the right to vote. As a result, the Muslim League swept the Muslim electorate on the basis of the demand for Pakistan, leaving little option for the British but to accede to partition. Issues such as the new nation's constitutional scheme, 
the status of various ethno-linguistic groups within Pakistan, and the role of religion and theologians in matters of state were barely discussed during the election campaign. No one knew how revenue would be raised, and there was no mention of the future state's foreign policy. One possible explanation for the ambiguity is that the demand for Pakistan was an instrument with which to bargain for greater political leverage for India's Muslim minority. By leaving future plans unspecified, some argue, Jinnah was trying to mobilize the broadest possible support for his position, which was open to change depending on the circumstances. Nevertheless, following independence, Pakistan has developed a clear national ideology and narrative that today is explicitly outlined at all levels of schooling. But during the years leading up to its creation, Pakistan meant different things to different people. For some, the country was to be a Muslim-majority state where greater economic opportunities would open up for Muslims without competition from non-Muslims. Others envisioned a utopia resembling the Muslim empires that dominated the Middle East from the 7th to the 12th centuries. Those who looked upon Jinnah as their great leader found a coherence in his exhortations that others dismissed as just clever arguments. Tom Trainer, for example, wondered how Pakistan would help protect the 25 million Muslims who would be left behind in India after Pakistan was created. Jinnah argued, Because 25 million of my people must suffer, should I sacrifice the other 75 million? Should I? Jinnah and his lieutenants offered little beyond sharply crafted statements and speeches to explain the idea of Pakistan. Pakistan is not the product of the conduct or misconduct of the Hindus, Jinnah explained. It had always been there, only they were not conscious of it. Hindus and Muslims, though living in the same towns and villages, had never blended into one nation. They were always two separate entities. To this day, Pakistani schoolchildren are taught that the roots of Pakistan go back to the arrival of the first Muslim conqueror in the subcontinent, in 712 AD. We are a nation, Jinnah argued, with our own distinctive culture and civilization, language and literature, art and architecture, names and nomenclature, sense of values and proportion, legal laws and moral codes, customs and calendar, history and traditions, aptitudes and ambitions. In short, we have our own distinctive outlook on life and of life. By all canons of international law, we are a nation. But the Muslim League still did not offer any book-length elaboration of the idea of a separate Muslim homeland, and how recognizing Muslims as a separate nation in the subcontinent would work in practice. The party's official newspaper, Dawn, carried polemical pieces about the poor prospects for Muslims under future Hindu domination. These served as exhortations to Muslims to press their claim for separate statehood. But there was virtually no discussion of tough questions about economics, national security policy, and potential inter-ethnic conflict, all of which remained unanswered before independence. This pattern of avoiding details of policy persisted even after Pakistan had appeared on the world map. Soon after independence, Differences between East and West Pakistan and ethnic differences between Pakistanis surfaced, but these were papered over with religious grandiloquence. Pakistan was officially described as Mamlakat Kudadad, Persian for divinely granted state. Soon prominent individuals within the government mooted proposals for adopting Arabic as the national language and of changing the script of the Bengali language from its Sanskrit base to an Arabic-Persian one. Within a few years, the president of the Muslim League, Chaudhry Khalik uz zaman announced that Pakistan would bring all Muslim countries together into Islamistan, a pan-Islamic entity. None of these developments within the new country elicited approval among Americans for the idea of India's partition. The New York Times saw the dislocation of millions resulting from partition as a great tragedy and attributed it to the insistence of the Muslim leaders on the partition of an economically homogenous territory along religious lines. 
In an editorial, the paper argued that 400 million people in both dominions are paying a high price for a division that is hardly understandable to countries where the political principle of separation of church and state is firmly established. Bork White, among others, questioned whether Jinnah had given much thought to the human cost of partition, stating, More Muslim lives had been sacrificed to create the new Muslim homeland than America, for example, had lost during the entire Second World War. She also found disturbing that one month after the country had been created, Jinnah was unwilling to share details of his plans for it. When she asked about the future, all Jinnah said was, of course it will be a democratic constitution. Islam is a democratic religion. Asked to define what he considered democracy, Pakistan's founder declared, Democracy is not just a new thing we are learning. It is in our blood. We have always had our system of zakat, our obligation to the poor. Jinnah's frequent assertion that our Islamic ideas have been based on democracy and social justice since the 13th century often drew applause from his Pakistani followers. But this mention of the 13th century troubled Americans. Bork White noticed that Pakistan's leaders were unwilling to discuss how they would transition from a feudal order to a modern democracy. There had also been no serious discussion of the relationship between true Islamic principles and the new nation's laws. All Jinnah told Bork White was that the constitution would be democratic because the soil is perfectly fertile for democracy. The two-nation theory, the founding premise of Pakistan, had little appeal outside of Pakistan, just as few outside of Northern Ireland, Ulster, Protestants, found the two-nation theory in Ireland appealing. Despite this, in anticipation of independence, Jinnah sought support from other Muslim-majority countries. In 1946, he told a conference in Cairo, It is only when Pakistan is established that Indian and Egyptian Muslims will be really free. Otherwise, there will be the menace of a Hindu imperialist Raj spreading its tentacles right across the Middle East. But arguments about a Hindu imperialistic power suffusing the British imperialistic power did not impress the Arab audience. British Prime Minister Clement Attlee voiced the international consensus at the time when he told the House of Commons of his hope that this severance may not endure. He hoped that the proposed dominions of India and Pakistan would, in course of time, come together again to form one great member state of the British Commonwealth of Nations. During the same debate in the British Parliament, the Secretary of State for India, Lord Listowel, stated his expectation that when the disadvantages of separation have become apparent in the light of experience, the two dominions will freely decide to reunite in a single Indian dominion, which might achieve that position among the nations of the world to which its territories and resources would entitle it. Jinnah's rhetoric about a Hindu empire rising out of the dust of the British Raj had inflamed Muslim passions in India, as had statements about the impending end of Islam in India, and even in other Muslim countries. But outside the subcontinent's inveigled context, it meant little and moved few. Soon after independence, Pakistan found that some Muslim countries chose to side with India once the Hindu-Muslim division was presented as a Pakistan-India conflict. During this time, most of the Arab world was going through a nationalist awakening. Pan-Islamic dreams involving the unification of Muslim countries, possibly under Pakistani leadership, had little attraction. Likewise, within Pakistan, ethno-linguistic nationalism remained alive, challenging the idea of religion-based nationhood within a few months. Meanwhile, some American observers tried to figure out Pakistan's emerging strategy survival as a new state. On the one hand, Pakistan sought Western aid and arms to compensate for its initial lack of resources. On the other, it sought to define its nationhood through Islam, pursuing leadership of the Muslim world. Jinnah's most frequently used technique in the struggle for his new nation had been the playing of opponent against opponent, Bork Wright wrote scathingly. Evidently, this technique was now to be extended into foreign policy. Not only the tension between the great powers, 
but the Palestine situation as well, held opportunities for profiting from the disputes of others. Pakistan was occupied with her own grave internal problems, but she still found time to talk fervently, though vaguely, of sending a Liberation Army to Palestine to help the Arabs free the Holy Land from the Jews. The Life Reporter also found it strange that Pakistan's leaders found time to comment on distant issues such as Palestine, while there were serious difficulties at home. Millions of refugees from India awaited settlement, there was little money in the treasury, and the emigration of Sikh and Hindu merchants out of Pakistan had resulted in a deficit of capital available for investment. But amidst all this, Muslim divines began advocating that trained ex-servicemen be dispatched in the holy cause of Palestine. Bork White noticed that Dawn, the official government newspaper, condemned the Jewish state and urged a united front of Muslim countries in the military as well as the spiritual sense, with one editorial asserting, that way lies the salvation of Islam. Foreign criticism of the very idea of Pakistani nationhood heightened Pakistan enthusiasts' commitment to the new country. A national narrative emerged about the origins and purpose of Pakistan that simultaneously fed paranoia about global conspiracies to eliminate Pakistan soon after its inception. In this way, developments during the first two years of Pakistan's existence as an independent state foreshadowed the path the country was to take in subsequent decades. Pakistan actively sought to become a Western ally on the one hand and embraced anti-Western Islamic vocabulary on the other. Economic and military necessity forced Pakistan to seek an international patron in the United States, whereas an inadequately defined Islamic nationalism made shunning the idea of being that patron's client equally necessary. The ambiguity about Pakistan's raison d'etre that had served well during the struggle for statehood led to internal disharmony soon after its creation. Jinnah and his subordinates had rallied India's Muslims on the basis of perceived threats to their Islamic way of life. But Pakistan's leaders were westernized individuals not known for religious learning or practice. Soon after partition, the more religious Pakistanis started clamoring for the state to be run in accordance with Islamic Sharia law. Jinnah tried to clarify that the new country was intended as a homeland for Muslims, but would not have a role for religion in its governance. In a landmark inaugural address before Pakistan's Constituent Assembly on August 11, 1947, Jinnah declared that in course of time, Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense as citizens of the state. About a year later, in its commentary on his death, Time magazine lamented that the inflammatory preachings of Jinnah, the agitator, would live on, but the occasional restraining hand of Jinnah the politician had been removed. After his death in September 1948, Jinnah's successors faced difficulty convincing their countrymen that Pakistani nationalism could be completely secular. To maintain the momentum generated during the political campaign that led to Pakistan's independence, the country's first Prime Minister, Liaquat Ali Khan, often referred to as Liaquat due to the common occurrence of his last name, Khan, introduced the concept of a national ideology. With this, Pakistan's Islamic identity would be an ideological safeguard protecting its territorial integrity and preventing internal disputes and disruption. Khan went on to describe Pakistan's ideology as the Islamic way of life, rooted in faith, tradition and belief, which has been a part of man's heritage for over 1,300 years. He argued that this ideology had unified the Indian Muslims in seeking Pakistan and would likewise enable Pakistan to emerge as an effective, functional state. Parallel to the emphasis on Islam as a national unifier, ran the argument that Hindus were eager to avenge centuries of Muslim rule over the subcontinent and sought to eliminate Muslim identity. Although communal violence during partition had equally affected Hindus, Sikhs and Muslims, 
Pakistani officials and writers chose to present that violence as being targeted only at Muslims. Liaquat described the mayhem as the sacrifice of India's Muslims for the creation of Pakistan, as an editorial in Dawn claimed that hundreds of thousands of Muslims were forcibly converted to Hinduism, almost simultaneously with the attainment of independence by the Hindus after a thousand years of slavery. Jinnah delivered a speech that called for religion to be relegated to the private domain. But his words had little effect on the passions that had been aroused in the populace to create Pakistan, emotions that were continuously reinforced to consolidate its statehood after independence. A year after it was delivered, the government republished Jinnah's inaugural speech, but excised the portion that spoke of citizens ceasing to be Muslims or Hindus in a political sense. After all, Pakistan was soon on its way to becoming an Islamic state, not just a homeland for Muslims seeking to avoid being a permanent minority in post-British India. The need to justify their country at an ideological level was only one part of the challenge Pakistan's founding fathers faced. They also needed resources to sustain the country. Although some men like Liaquat and Abul Hassan Ispahani gifted some of their property to the new state and had no plans of returning to India. For several years after independence, some of Pakistan's elite acted as if their country was temporary. For instance, Jinnah told India's Prime Minister Nehru, through India's ambassador to Pakistan, that he wanted his house in Bombay kept in good condition so that he could retire there. Pakistan's first ambassador to India, Mohammed Ismail, assumed his responsibilities without migrating to Pakistan, and at one point claimed that he had not ceased to be an Indian national by becoming Pakistan's diplomatic representative. And well-to-do Muslim politicians and officials went back and forth, trying to figure out where their careers might prosper more. Some wanted to become Pakistani without losing the benefits of being Indian. It took several years for Pakistan to define its citizenship laws in regard especially to migrants or Indian refugees. The partition plan provided only 72 days for transition from British rule to full independence, and communal rioting consumed most of that time. The hasty drawing of boundaries, division of civil and military services, and apportioning of assets were particularly detrimental to Pakistan. As one Pakistani official later put it, Pakistan, unlike India, inherited neither a capital nor government, nor the financial resources to establish and equip the administrative, economic and military institutions of the new state. Pakistan also had virtually no industry, and the major markets of its agricultural products were in India. The non-Muslim entrepreneurial class that had dominated commerce in the areas now constituting Pakistan either fled or transferred its capital across the new border. Uncertainties about Pakistan's survival, as well as communal violence, further exacerbated this flight of capital, shrinking the already narrow revenue base of the new country. Further, the Reserve Bank of India held the Pakistan government's monetary assets, and given the atmosphere of hostility between Congress and Muslim League partisans, the division and transfer of assets was by no means a smooth process. Pakistan's earliest government officials feared their new country's economic strangulation and saw a Hindu design to force Pakistan to its knees. The Congress party that led independent India had opposed the idea of Pakistan, so its leaders were certainly not eager to help the new state. Indian assurances that their reluctant acceptance of partition did not reflect a desire to undo it by force were not believed in Pakistan. Upon partition, Pakistan had received 30% of British India's army, 40% of its navy, and 20% of its air force. Its share of revenue, however, was a meagre 17%, leading to concerns about the new state's ability to pay for all its armed forces. Within days of independence, Pakistan was concerned about its share of India's assets, both financial and military. India's decision to delay transferring Pakistan's share of assets further increased the bitterness of partition. Gandhi, the father of modern India, 
recognized the importance of containing that bitterness in India-Pakistan relations. Because of this, he went on a fast in January 1948, demanding that Pakistan's share of the monetary assets be paid. But the terms of the partition did not fully satisfy Pakistanis. They felt, and the new state's leaders exacerbated this, that the Indians, as well as the British, had deliberately created additional problems for the new country while dividing the assets and especially in demarcating the border. Among the contentious issues born out of the partition was that of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir. Pakistanis expected the Kashmir region, given its Muslim majority, to be rightfully part of the new Muslim-majority country. When that did not happen, a sense of grievance immediately took root. This provided grounds for Pakistan's leaders to convert the Hindu-Muslim divide of the pre-partition era into a permanent Pakistan-India rivalry and justified retaining Pakistan's large military inherited from colonial rule and expending the bulk of the country's meagre resources on defence. It also fed the sense of Muslim victimhood that had led Muslims to demand Pakistan in the first place. During the British Raj, 562 princely states had retained varying degrees of administrative independence through treaties with Britain that had been concluded during the process of colonial penetration. Jammu and Kashmir was one of them. The treaty relationships conferred paramountcy on the British and, in most cases, control over defence, external affairs and communications. But the end of the Raj marked the end of paramountcy and at the time of partition, the British asked these states' rulers to choose between India and Pakistan, taking into consideration geographical contiguity and the wishes of their subjects. Because of Kashmir's contiguity with Pakistan and its Muslim majority, Pakistan's leaders anticipated that it would join the new Muslim country. But the state's ruler at the time of partition, Maharaj Hari Singh, a Hindu, sought to retain independence even though a segment of his Muslim subjects wanted Kashmir to join Pakistan. Some scholars argue that Indian Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru had thought through a grand strategy for the princely states, including a design to ensure that Jammu and Kashmir would be a part of the independent Indian Union. Having a Muslim-majority state in India would also help highlight that country's secular character. For the exact opposite reason, however, Pakistan needed Kashmir to prove the rationale for partition. Most Pakistani leaders and scholars, as well as some Western authors, implicate the last British Viceroy, Lord Louis Mountbatten, and members of his staff in a plot to draw the partition boundary so that Kashmir would abut both India and Pakistan. Further, under the partition plan, the province of Punjab was to be divided between India and Pakistan on grounds of contiguity and its religious majority. The Boundary Commission, led by British judge Sir Cyril Radcliffe, awarded two Muslim-majority tassils, subdivisions, in Gurdaspur district to India, providing overland access to Kashmir from India. Had the map of the Punjab been drawn differently, Kashmir could have ended up with road access only to Pakistan and a natural mountainous frontier with India, which would have precluded any effective Indian claim on the princely state. But the chaotic condition of government in the newly born state of Pakistan left little room for planning grand strategy. Pakistanis felt that the Boundary Commission cheated them. The concern about the future of Kashmir was addressed by supporting the pro-Pakistan All Jammu and Kashmir Muslim Conference, which led an agitation against the Maharaja. Pashtun tribesmen were hastily trained in Pakistan's northwest frontier province to enter Kashmir with support from Pakistani military officers. The fact that a British general headed the new Pakistani army limited the scope for a declaration of war against the ill-equipped forces of a British-allied Maharaja. The Indians, however, sought support from Kashmir's most popular Muslim leader at the time, Sheikh Abdullah, who did not share Jinnah's vision of Pakistan. Thus, Pakistan's first move in Kashmir was to announce jihad by unofficial forces. 
An unconventional war was started on the assumption that the Kashmiri people would support the invading tribal Lashkar, unstructured army, and that the Maharaja's forces would be easily subdued. Little, if any thought, had been given to the prospect of failure, or to what might happen if the Indian army got involved in forestalling a Pakistani fait accompli.